Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin our third panel on developing Hong Kong as a sustainability hub through innovation. May we now invite our speakers of the panel to come up to the stage. Ms. Ali Tang, Head of Sustainability, New World Development Company Limited. Dr. William Yu, Founder and CEO, World Green Organization. Ms. Tracy Wong Harris, Vice President and Deputy Secretary General, Hong Kong Green Finance Association, and Head of Sustainable Finance, Greater China and North Asia, Standard Chartered Bank. Thank you. Let's pass it over to our moderator, Alexander Chen, co-director, Demius Rabica. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. For those uh, dialing in from online, thank you for the patience with us. Uh, you know, we've, we've come to the final panel of today, and uh, it is an exciting topic that has resonated throughout the rest of Start Me Up Hong Kong, ESG. Today, Hong Kong has an unprecedented opportunity coming out from COVID-19, coming out from diversity movements in the US, coming out from regulation changes from all around the world, especially in China and Hong Kong. We have an unprecedented opportunity uh, with ESG. ESG has come out as the forefront of all conversations in the past year. Uh, the question that we want to explore more today is, what about the role of innovation in terms of sustainability? How can innovation play a role in accelerating sustainability forward? So we're very to three distinguished uh, panel speakers from different parts of the industry to share on today's topic. Uh, and I'll get each of them to quickly introduce themselves and also share a bit about you know, trends that they see in ESG in Hong Kong so far. So maybe Tracy, you can kick us off. Sure, um, uh, Tracy Wong Harris um, has uh, already been introduced, so I'm not going to repeat that now. So I guess I would like to share the progress made so far today uh, in terms of the green and sustainable finance market in two lands. So innovation can be in many ways, uh, technology advancement, regulation, policy, product, etc. But I want you to take you through the, from the regulatory space, from Hong Kong for these last few, few years, and also the sustainable finance product space. So from the regulation side or uh, policy development as such, so I guess I go back to back in 2018 when Hong Kong Green Finance Association first established. So this is exactly missions for Hong Kong Green Finance Association is to position Hong Kong to be a leading green and sustainable finance hub. Um, working with, so with the associations been working very closely with the governments, the regulators and the industry across to drive and position this. So let me quickly run through our individual regulators' uh, development so far. So after the establishment of the Hong Kong Green Finance Association, in 2019, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, HKMA, announced the three key measures on driving green and sustainable finance, with number one on driving green and sustainable banking. Secondly, it's responsible investment. As you know, um, Hong Kong sitting on a large exchange trade fund. So the way that deploying the investment in a responsible way. Lastly, is on um, setting up a center of uh, finance for market capacity building to bring the banking industry up the curve in, dry, uh, in, in being more sustainable and uh, uh, in that space. And also fast forward, um, last year, um, the MA has signed an MOU with the World Bank IFC in terms of um, greening, anchoring Hong Kong to be um, for green banking. So that's from the MA perspective. Then on the SFC side, so um, they has gone through a long journey and really looking into the asset owner, asset manager space. And um, this year, January, they have concluded the management of um, how climate risk should be managed from the asset manager side. So we expect that they announce the results sometime very soon, and um, I would expect some changes in the asset manager's uh, space to come. Now, last but not least, I think stock exchange. So you might already heard that our Hong Kong Stock Exchange have established a platform called Stage. So this is a sustainable uh, um, finance platform for hosting all our uh, green and finance product for Hong Kong. Of course, uh, all the bonds arranged and listed in Hong Kong will be, uh, will be listed there. And also, I guess with the view to be the one-stop shop for all the investors to come in uh, to, uh, to, uh, on, on the product set. Um, Actually, I would like to share a couple more uh, ideas on here where um, a very significant movement from 
um, across the governments and regulators. So last year, the um, Green and Sustainable Finance Cross Agency Steering Committee um, has established this comprise of two Hong Kong government, the Environmental Bureau, the FSTB, and five regulators, the Monetary Authority, SFC, HKEX, together with Insurance Authority and MPFA, they all group together really to drive and position uh, Hong Kong to be the finance hub. And they have published the Hong Kong Green and Sustainable Finance um, Strategy end of last year. So if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go to the HKGFA website to, to look at the strategy for Hong Kong in that space. Um, also, um, our earlier panel talked about GBA. Last year, we also launched the Greater Bay Area Green Finance Alliance. This is a platform where Hong Kong, Macau, Shenzhen, uh, Guangzhou all collaborate together to create this uh, platform to host research and incubate green investment. So this is the journey of how Hong Kong has developed so far uh, from the policy, from the regulator of government side. Now, looking through to the product side, um, green and sustainable product. So I describe this from green to rainbow. So we started seeing the product in terms of simple, green loans, green bonds, blue bonds, and then to GSS, which is green social sustainability. Sustainability is just a simple of combining the green and blue and the social element. Then in the last two, three years, we have seen a strong pickup on sustainability link product. This is something that um, we have, um, the borrower have to, um, anchor themselves on some particular environmental or social KPI to deliver, for example, very topical is we are talking about decarbonization. So what is the uh, uh, KPI that we can uh, hook up uh, the borrower to um, uh, agree to? And then they receive um, either incentive or penalty for not delivering such. So this is sustainability link product. And to finally, the transition. So how do we um, uh, provide financing on transition some of the um, non-brown or heavy carbon intense industry in this space? So that is kind of the journey for, uh, from the product side. Um, I'm watching out for the time, so I can talk about this whole day long, but I'm um, happy to talk more later. But let me pass the floor to my <laughs> colleague. My panel is here. Thank you. Um, maybe let me uh, briefly introduce myself. Uh, apart from funding World Green Organization and NGO, uh, I also advise like investment bank or audit firm on um, ESG best practice, uh, carbon neutral solutions, forestry solution. Um, so we, we are going to organize a, a climate finance conference with the United Nations this September in, in Hong Kong. Uh, so as you can see, uh, we have one focus on green finance, how to make good use of this green financial instrument to make things happen. And at the same time, uh, I'm also helping the companies in uh, science part on smart city solution. Okay, so also uh, some companies in cyberport uh, focusing on uh, a low carbon solution. So when you talk about uh, innovation, I, I would say carbon neutral. Because our manufacturing process, or even our financing arrangement, all are high carbon. That is the traditional way of doing business. So now we should look for innovation, how to bring low carbon or even zero carbon or carbon negative to our products, to our manufacturing process, to our financing, like green bonds, okay, um, sustainability loan, all this. So now we should have green finance, green tech in place, and also I think um, what we need is an ecosystem to bring all this together to nurture the potential, okay? So uh, a lot, a lot to do about innovation, okay, Ellie. Well, thanks for, for passing the mic. Um, Ellie Tang from New World Sustainability. So um, I guess different from the other two speakers, I come from more of a corporate perspective. And to um, Alex's question about, you know, why ESG and what does that really mean in the context of Hong Kong? And as I was listening to our, um, you know, fellow panelists sharing, I think ESG itself as a mindset and uh, an approach already is an innovation because what it actually advocates, um, you know, by definition of 
look at, for corporations at least to look at environmental, social, and governance issues. Um, these are the things that without, say, a reporting requirement or without the sustainable uh, sustainability movement, um, traditional corporations would otherwise overlook. And now, because um, you know there is um, an incentive, whether it's you know green financing, social financing, or rainbow financing, which is really exciting, these are simply tools to help us accelerate the um, success of sustainable development. So, for corporations to have this um, urgency to really you know integrate environmental, social, and governance principles into their business planning, their performance tracking, and finally their disclosure. Um, is forcing partnership to happen, right? Um, for businesses to think about, in addition to driving their day-to-day, -day, their um, operation, their financial bottom line, we have to think about how do we actually benefit the well-being of our employees, the communities in which we operate and serve, um, and whether our operation and our future planning or even you know, indirect investments are doing good or bad to the environment. Um, so I think this is um, sort of the, the context that we see it. And back to Hong Kong and GBA, I think in terms of sustainability challenges, um, a lot of people say, you know, across ES and G issues, environmental always gets the most attention. And that's true, because it's the easiest to quantify, per se, right? Um, but that's not to say social and governance are unimportant, because before this whole discourse of ESG became a thing, um, corporations, especially the listed corporates, um, have been evaluated based on um, their governance performance mat metrics, be it their board composition, um, you know, like how, um, it, whether their dividends policy um, is only benefiting their, their directors or wider shareholders, um, so on and so forth, whether they respect diversity and promote it through their, um, you know, their makeup um, of, of the workforce and the board. Um, but within the environmental space, um, there, there is a lot of attention um, among, uh, for climate change, and rightly so, right? Um, we're all experiencing the hottest May uh, recorded in Hong Kong's history in 140 years. It's not even June. How do we um, get to 2030 or 2050? So I think, yes, like environmental issues, climate change, these are our utmost priorities, but how do we actually um, you know, tackle these together as partners? We need to look into innovation, be it um, technology that help us decarbonize, or even simply data analytics tools that help us understand the challenges that we are facing and um, will basically take stock of how we're performing so far, where we need to get to, and what's the gap. And then we can talk about um, the you know, deeper um, sort of uh, verticals within innovation. It's, so it's amazing because you know, a lot of the trends that you guys have highlighted, everything has been within the past two to three years. You mentioned again, Green Finance Association starting 2018. It's amazing to see the acceleration uh, and if you think about it, that you know, sustainability ESG used to be something that is compliance. It used to be something that's you know, at the side with CSR or marketing teams even, now moving to the top of the agenda. If sustainability is the objective we want to get to, innovation can be one of the means to help accelerate that. So one question that I'd you know, love to get your views on is whether you think about whether it's a corporate or the role of capital or in the third sector of NGOs, how can these different stakeholders help accelerate innovations for sustainability. So, you know, maybe we're going to start with you, like there's a lot that K11 New World has done in embracing and adopting innovations for sustainability. Um, we're definitely trying. Um, so, like you mentioned, I mean, as with any other corporates and, and peers, stakeholders, uh, we're, we're starting to run a couple years ago. Um, and the way we do that, because New World Group is not just a property developer. We have businesses in infrastructure, retail, um, hospitality, healthcare, so on and so forth. So we are one ecosystem um, on our own as well. Um, but we try to keep the platform quite open in terms of um, welcoming new ideas, welcoming new partners to see how we can tackle these sustainability issues together. Um, but first, I think um, setting the scene right and putting everybody on the same page is important. So we have referenced UN Sustainable Development Goals as um, a broad framework to select key priorities. Um, and from there onwards, we set our Sustainability Vision 2030 with four key pillars, green, wellness, smart, and caring. And um, these four key traits are infused into our new products, our existing services, and you know, the way we communicate sustainability and try to um, you know, get feedback on. 
Um, many, uh, there are a lot of different opportunities and different um, case studies. But of course, we start to you know, integrate ESG into the core of our core business, which is property. Um, so from you know, building new certified um, green and healthy buildings to setting um, real targets to reduce carbon during our operation and facilitating our tenants, our suppliers, um, you know, to look into opportunities to reduce their um, embodied carbon um, or our indirect emissions um, are areas that we have looked into. So um, just some quick examples. Um, construction, as everybody can imagine, is um, a very you know, emissions intensive activity. It uses a lot of energy, a lot of water, so we have um, partnered with um, local institutions, for example, the um, NAMI at Science Park Nanomaterial Institute to look into um, how to decarbonize cement as a key um, construction material. Um, and during the construction phase, um, there, you know, traditionally uh, there's a lot of um, diesel-based generators to power up construction activities. Um, we're working with AMD Energy um, to look into these, um, you know, um, diesel-free power supply systems um, on the site. Um, and in addition to reducing our energy and um, you know, carbon emissions, um, it also has a key side benefit of reducing air pollution and supporting um, the ongoing health and safety improvement of our on-site construction workers. Because diesel generators is higher carbon and then you know, the battery system is zero carbon. Um, so a lot of these, um, you know, bits and pieces added together. And then more recently, we think, hey, like, we are an ecosystem, so how can we actually scale up our partnership? Um, so, you know, we, we look at um, the landscape of Hong Kong, and we decided to establish Impact Commons, which is a sustainability-themed um, B2B accelerator for startups to match with New World's different business units. We started this in 2019, um, and we just completed our second cohort. We um, you know, generated 21 different types of integrations from, you know, um, allowing wellness products to open doors through our retail um, business units to um, welcoming um, social enterprises that can upcycle our construction wood waste into hoarding, into furniture, um, to other, you know, software applications um, tackling sustainability issues. Um, so I think um, in, in one line, I think corporations offer um, pilot opportunities, testing ground, and resources to scale um, innovative partnerships. Excellent. And I guess, yeah, well, like from your side, I mean, can you uh, hear like... I, mm -hmm. I can give you two examples. Um, one is about forestry solution, you know, uh, to achieve a kind of carbon asset management. You, you need um, planting trees to absorb carbon, you know, a kind of offset mechanism. Okay, imagine, um, you know the farmers, you know the agriculture experts, but do they know carbon trading? Do they know how to calculate the carbon emissions? What species is suitable to absorb high level of uh, carbon? You know, so uh, what we are talking about, you, you mentioned about the cross-sector collaboration. Very difficult, even within the same segment, you, you need cross-discipline cooperation. Now, why we need an ecosystem? Okay, you should give me some advertising, you know, uh, commission. Okay, I keep mentioning about your, your uh, name, your forum, because we only specialize in one area. We need to facilitate this cross-discipline collaboration. Okay, um, they, they don't know, um, the finance guy, I, I no offense, okay, they, they are good at a financial instrument, but do you know about biodiversity? Why biodiversity? To uh, af avoid the risk of, you know, for one species being infected or die and then result in a kind of economic loss. Okay, so that's why, like TCFD, um, the climate risk uh, for financial disclosure, right? So um, they always suggest invite the climate scientists to meet with financial experts to talk about, like um, Ali mentioned about all this building stuff, construction. Okay, in case of the climate, uh, climate disaster, okay, how to evaluate the, the impact and also the economic loss. Now we need the base. Now we need this cross discipline sharing to figure out all this financial pro projection. 
So um, I, I work on this uh, project. I, I'm very painful because when I talk to different people, they only know their past. How to bring them together? Or even to a certain extent, they don't need to understand the other's expertise. But we need an uh, intermediary to you know, make things happen. OK, think about this. OK, um, so we're working with the global engineering firm and also university to uh, figure out the TCFD transition. So how to quantify climate risk, transition risk, physical risk that we are going to face to help the corporate to understand more about the future impact uh, and also the financial implication. That's very important. So we need this environment. We need this mechanism to bring people with different expertise together to make things happen. Thank you. Tracy, and you want to share a bit more about the role of capital for innovations? Sure. I want to, uh, um, 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 in response to William's point about you know collaboration, understanding both sides. So green and sustainable finance is exactly that. It's the hybrid. It's the bridge between the environmental science and the financial market. Because essentially, you need that. So let me give you a little bit of background. So. To, in order for us to achieve the Paris Agreement to keep temperature rise to below two degree, we, we need an additional of 60 trillion US dollar in order to have a chance to, to keep the temperature rise to below two degree. Bring it closer to home and look at China, Hong Kong. So China already came out with the carbon neutrality target uh, by 2060, um, um, peak at 2030. And Hong Kong also came out with net zero by 2050. What does it mean? We need to be able to channel um, over 20 trillion US dollar in order to achieve that. So this is very important about knowing, uh, uh, you know, you have this massive funding gap to fund, you know, all the innovation required, technology, advancement, product, you know, et cetera. But capital is actually at the core fund. You need that in order to fill this gap to enable, you know, the environmental front and innovation to achieve the goal. So I would say, I arguably say that's one of the most important capital to deliver the less zero pathway. So, and you know, when you think about, I think the, what you mentioned, right? China wants to be carbon neutral by 2060, achieving peak before 2030. It, you know, it sounds like a lot, lot of time that we have, but it's actually not that much time. Uh, what do you guys see as some of the challenges? What can ecosystem builders do more of in the process? Okay, let me get started. Uh, over 110 countries have already announced carbon neutral target. Quite a lot, right? So um, now it's on the national level, okay? Many argument on reporting, on measurement, on verification. It takes time to go through. Then down to another level, that is the corporate. How to engage business corporate? You know, when business start to work on this, things will change, definitely, okay? Because of the resources, usage, efficiency, everything. So now we need to get the private sector involved. As I'm uh, also sitting in the United Nations uh, uh, Task Force Group, what they now to, uh, on green finance, what they look for is to involve the private sector. Things will change. Okay, money, money, okay, 20 trillion, okay. Uh, I don't know how many cereal, how many figures. Uh, numerical figures are there. But what I want to say is um, now we need to equip the private sector, all these corporations, to get start this green journey. Okay, in the past, okay, we have green office, established green office program in Hong Kong. Now over 400 companies participate. Okay, KPMG, uh, okay, um, DHL, uh, uh, Morgan Stanley, okay, they, they all participate. But it's not enough. We need to translate this into their business model. That is the ESG core value, right? You know, to incorporate all these best practice, environmental friendly, or even low carbon or zero carbon best practice into the operation. How? I, I think that's the question we, we keep asking about this. So I, I think um, now is uh, we need also to create um, a platform 
to facilitate this to happen. But sometimes government work on the policy. It takes longer, longer time to make things change. But for business, there is always an argument not to talk about the business, government, uh, this kind of collusion, okay, this kind of troublesome. Whether uh, business have enough resources to bring all these solutions together. If not, how can we work together, you know, to bring resources like new technology from overseas and also take out the local technology, maybe from university, from startup, from small companies. So I, I think uh, now we, we need this kind of platform. Although you, you might say we have already have some science bar, have cyber pro, but um, how to you know, uh, focus on the green tech especially. I, I think we, we, we should think about this. Um, so getting cooperation ready and what kind of engagement approach we should use. I, I think we, we need to think about. Sometimes we think, oh, business, they have resources. Okay, we should not give them additional support. Is that true? Or they, can they form business consortium to group all these resources together? Sometimes we, call up, uh, we talk about co-create, co-design, co but they are competitors, but at the same time, they need to collaborate. But how to make this happen? I, I think we, we should figure out this. Tracy, Ali. Okay, I'll go first, if that's okay. Um, I think corporations, or just business sector in general, um, definitely has room and the responsibility to step up, right? But when we think about um, you know, additional resource, um, investment from corporations. Corporations would then think about where should we invest these resources, how much, and to where first. So in this regard, I think the public sector um, has a role to play in creating the perfect storm and to you know sort of highlight the priorities um, and to really um, clear uh, clarify the definition of net zero for Hong Kong which sectors um, need to do more or less, um, how the government would meet them halfway, um, and whether there will be, you know, like matching grants or tax benefits. Um, and, you know, really fundamentally when we talk about net zero, while Hong Kong and the rest of the Greater Bay Area um, are still growing in terms of, you know, developing, development, construction and whatnot, um, inevitably there will be construction, there will be um, new activities, and there will be resource consumption. Um, so to achieve net zero, in addition to reducing businesses' own um, operational emissions, we need to look into how to abate carbon emissions. Um, would there be a carbon market? Um, what type of um, you know, carbon abatement um, is considered acceptable? And whether this is a, a cost exercise or could there be a trading component to this carbon platform? All of these are unknown at this point. So from the corporate pers uh, perspective, um, we do look forward to seeing um, policymakers flesh this out for us. Tracy, you like to start? Sure, I don't know where to start, but, um, but the, time, uh, the timing of the question is very timely on net zero journey. So we, um, Standard Charter just recently uh, issued a report. We interviewed 250 large corporate and over 100 investors on their journey of net zero. So we have found that the biggest, biggest challenge um, from this survey, over 65%, if I recall correctly, um, they pointed to lack of um, capital, lack of financing, especially in emerging market and where th on the more high carbon intense industry, um, knowingly so. Um, zooming in a little bit more into Hong Kong, China. So where do we see the accelerator in addressing this uh, net zero gap uh, for fast forward the net zero journey? So let me look at the cheat sheet on, on, on the number. 80% uh, pointed to stronger external incentive. Um, that is a very good uh, point where I also want to take the opportunity to uh, um, help our Hong Kong uh, government to promote. So recently, the Hong Kong government from 5th of 10th of May already came up with a, a green and sustainable finance grant scheme. So this is to really uh, try to accelerate the green and sustainable finance um, 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 sector on 
providing cash subsidy and incentive for uh, corporate uh, want to drive um, green and sustainable finance, may that be bond or loan deal uh, to cover the cost, cover the certification costs, external verify costs, and if you are also first uh, um, um, issuing uh, green bonds or sustainability bonds in Hong Kong. So external incentive point to one to accelerate. Secondly is to drive increase and investor demand in the transition film and asset. So again, transition is where it's very touchy, where, you know, at the end of the day, the high carbon intense industries still need a just transition pathway if we want to achieve net zero. So really to increase the in investor demand in that space. And lastly is on driving shareholders' um, activism in, um, in their um, investor scrutiny on this um, field space as well. I want to address and going back to our panelists in terms of um, um, capacity building and education. This is not just in one particular sector, not just in private sector or public sector. I think across all sector, we all need to be educated. So capacity building in one, any shape or form is a must. Financial industry, public, private, and also collaboration across. So we have seen very good um, concrete actions being taken. For example, I spoke about the cross agency steering committee, two government uh, body plus five regulators. Very unusual. We see this group together to drive one goal, and also the um, GBA GFA platform. This is multi. Um, um, governments, you know, across to drive green and sustainable finance. I think this is the first step, you know, to collaborate together, to work together. Um, I think this is the key. Yes, like we almost have time, so final question, right? Tying back to an earlier panel we had today about youth engagement. If someone is out there in the audience today is a youth thinking about starting a climate or sustainability business, uh, what advice would you have for, you know, that youth out there? And how can we engage with the public more as well? Starting business, you mean? Yeah, I, I've already started. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. And uh, what what I want to uh, t talk about first is to echo Eddie's journey on on the carbon trading. You know, this kind of uh, carbon asset, you know, management. I think that is important. Uh, we need to make good use of this green currency for the future, uh, either for investment or to to support and the development of startup. So for B2B, I, I can see we can rely on the uh, green finance channel, the traditional investment strategy after all this due diligence and you can approach the, the right company. But uh, I think B2C is also important. Although in the case of Hong Kong, um, our carbon trading market is too small. We have gone through several consultation no result, maybe think about Greater Bay, okay? The last session is all about Greater Bay, okay? So then maybe um, we, we can think about uh, a, a carbon trading scheme for the entire Greater Bay. And Hong Kong uh, and can always, you know, play a role in, as a financial hub. But still, B2C is also important in order to cultivate a, a healthy ecosystem. So, um, we may think about you know, to tokenize all these carbon assets in the future, to tokenize all these carbon neutral technology. You know, uh, it takes time to develop. It takes time for the technology to go through all these trial stage and finally commercialize. So um, we, if we have B to C, then um, it's more healthy for, for the enti entire development and B2B will respond at the same time. It's always the case. So we, we need to cre create a demand, we need to create a supply to make it a very healthy ecosystem. So to get started with a, a kind of sustainability business, I think now is uh, we need technology, we need uh, some kind of support in, our, in green finance, through green finance. And more important is um, uh, as I mentioned in the, the previous session is how to commercialize my prototype, my pilot uh, product, okay? So um, can we create an ecosystem? Okay, say for example, we have 1,000 corporates ready to use your 
technology. Okay, if we can, you know, uh, help to amplify, you know, all these uh, small startup to a bigger one. Um, so that is very important. Again, is the involvement of the private sector to get the corporate. Co corporate should welcome all this new technology, okay? Uh, make a trial. And at the same time, they can be the investor, as Elliot has mentioned, to grow the small business, to grow all these startup. Okay, I, I think that's very important. And then making the connection to the research center, university, or overseas market. That's the next step. I want to, since uh, carbon markets, carbon trading um, is being talked about, I want to just share a little bit uh, more in this space. So actually a lot of work's been going on for the last eight, 12, 18 months. So as I mentioned, the Greater Bay Area Green Finance Alliance, one of the key projects is actually looking at Carbon Connect. What is Hong Kong role in terms of um, carbon uh, connecting the China mandatory market in Hong Kong? And at the same time, also looking at our wider space in the voluntary market, voluntary carbon trading market, what is our role? So um, to fast forward, a lot of work and conversation have happened and if you go back and look at the cross-agency steering group um, strategy for Hong Kong, one of the key pillars, carbon market for GBA has been mentioned. So be for sure, I hope more to come in this space, um, in the carbon market. And also, was it this week? Yes, I think it was, no, last week. Last week in Singapore, um, the uh, voluntary carbon exchange has um, been born. So the competition is there. So we, we need to catch up in Hong Kong in that space. To go back very quickly to answer your question about if you have a business in thinking about green and sustainable business, I would encourage you to uh, reach out to my colleagues on the four um, Jennies and Phoebe in, from Hong Kong Green Finance Association because we really cut across the sectors from banking to asset owner manager, cross border green investment to um, to real estate, private equity. So we have many different working groups looking at different spectrums, ecosystem, in really trying to drive this space. So please reach out to my colleagues on the floor. Ellie, final, final words with you. I'll keep it really short. Um, I think never discount the power of one. Um, totally agree with what William said about, you know, B2C is just as good as B2B. And for new joiners in the sustainability industry, it's not as exclusive and technical as you think. Um, you know, little things like reducing waste through our day-to-day -day consumption, especially during COVID. You think about, you know, the single-use plastics and just general packaging that we, we have gone through in the past over a year. Um, that can yield big impact. Um, but I think whether or not um, a product can, you know, be, play a role in the carbon market or, you know, get resource and funding or pilot opportunities from public or private sector, you need to track your impact. So make sure um, whatever business you start, track your impact and test whether it's robust enough. And we could go on talking all day and we'll probably have served breakfast to everyone. But um, no, thank you so much for the great sharing. It is a super exciting topic and one that I think we're all super passionate about. So hopefully audience um, that who are listening, you're inspired and you can take action as well. Thank you very much for joining us today.